contrast it with mindlessness, when you don't quite realize where you are, you sort of forget. You're talking to somebody. Are they really listening to you, or are they somewhere else in their head? So you can be mindless, or you can be mindful and be tuned in. People who are not aware are at greater risk for anxiety and depression. And just being present, being in the moment, we know from the research also increases well-being. Yoga is the calming of the thought fluctuations of the mind, where we have this yoga and mindfulness connection. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Lennox. Welcome to The Zoomer, I'm Marissa Lennox. It's a technique that's gained traction in mainstream circles, in healthcare, in education, and in corporate settings. It's called mindfulness, and experts say the proven benefits are many, from boosting learning and memory to empathy and compassion. On today's show, we'll discuss the meaning of mindfulness and how practicing it can change your life. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. Some people quell stress with exercise, others with a glass of wine. But what if there was an elixir for the mind? There might be. It's called mindfulness, akin to the Buddhist practice of tuning into the physical over the emotional. Mindfulness practices range from meditation to yoga to mindful eating. One US study found that mindfulness decreased stress levels by 31% and increased vitality by 28%. Participants in a Canadian eight-week mindfulness program experienced a 30% decrease in anxiety and a 29% decrease in depression. And another US study showed improved productivity in the workplace, where absenteeism fell by 85%, while productivity rose by 120%. But remember, mindfulness is a state, not a trait, and requires practice. So Dr. Kelly, let's jump right in. What is mindfulness? We can look at it different ways. Partly it's something we all know how to do already, which is just to be awake and aware of what's happening. So we can contrast it with mindlessness when you uh, don't quite realize where you are, you sort of forget. You're talking to somebody, are they really listening to you or are they somewhere else in their head? So you can be mindless or you can be mindful and be tuned in. So that's the basic part of it. And then mindfulness too is a skill that can be learned and developed and brought to different areas of experience in life. And wh why? why, why should we be mindful? Why is this such a growing movement? Sue. Well, we spoke a little bit earlier about it. Um, we know from research that Richard Davidson, he's a neuroscientist in the United States, um, my celebrity crush, um, <laughs> he's been exploring people, just like Paul said, being aware and awake in the moment. And he's been exploring how awake people are by having them carry devices around and they have to report several times during a day whether or not they're aware of what they're doing, just like you said. Body sensations, awareness, and people who are not aware are at greater risk for anxiety, depression, and just being present, being in the moment, we know from the research also increases well-being and, yeah. What does it look like for you, Paul? You're a practitioner of mindfulness. What does, what does that look like in sort of every day? How do you practice? So from my, a daily morning meditation of about 30 minutes. And uh, so it's, for me, it's a, like a spiritual practice. Um, I, would call myself an agnostic. I don't believe, not sure about the God. I call it the great mystery. But for me, it's uh, a daily practice where I try to be present and um, follow my breath. Uh, that's the main technique that I use. And uh, when my thoughts come up, and that's, I'm a human being, that we think. And so I just, allow my thoughts to go and come back to my breath. And how has it helped you? Um, initially, I took the mindfulness-based stress reduction course. So it was an eight-week course. And it, I was getting, having some stress at work. And it helped me uh, deal with that. And it just, the daily practice just opened up an avenue of, a spiritual practice in my life, which I value. Mm -hmm. Who are the 
types of people that would benefit Dr. Farb from mindfulness? Um, is, it, is it people who, who suffer from extreme stress or are there other types? I mean, would, ev would everyone benefit for that matter? Uh, yeah, I think if you're looking for stress reduction, uh, there's a good chance uh, it'll benefit um, people from all walks of life. Uh, I like to think of it more as trying to develop skills. Um, so the ability to know one's own mind, to be able to uh, see when one is upset or when one is reacting without having to immediately control or, or tamp down that situation. And these are skills that um, can be developed whether you happen to be privileged to already be high in self-awareness and, and reflection or, or low in it. It doesn't seem to, to matter. Now, as a neuroscientist, I'd be remiss to not ask what happens in the brain when we actually engage in this practice? Yeah, so it's a, a complicated uh, answer, but the, the short form of it is um, what seems to be happening in, in the first few years of practice is people are, are learning to snap out of their habitual mode of thinking. So the sort of parts of our brain that help us know things automatically and know how to respond automatically get disrupted, but in a constructive way so that we can explore, well, what other options do I have? How else could I perceive or respond to this situation? And that engages a different brain network for sensing and responding to what's happening in the moment. All right, well, we'll, we'll pick up on the other side of the break what you were just talking about when we come back. We take a look at the growing mindful movement and later simple ways to bring mindfulness to your yoga practice. Don't go away. Are you uh, living in your life openly or are you just kind of a ghost in your life as it happens? So mindfulness helps us tune in and be present. Society so interconnected with technology, one of the best ways to handle the intensity of it all is to disconnect through the practice of mindfulness. And for my first stop, I'm here to learn about the tradition of sound therapy. Sound therapy is an exercise in deep listening. So you become present with yourself and you give yourself the permission to just relax. So during a sound bath, the facilitator intentionally combines a combination of instruments to create a soundscape that will relax the body. The body is absorbing these healing vibrations because sound is medicine. Like sound therapy, meditation is also medicine and Diana has overcome a traumatic experience through its practice. Meditation came into my life about 10 years ago. I was going through a grief period and a friend suggested that I listen to a meditation CD. It really helped me find meaning and purpose. When you go within, you're able to really discover who you are and it gives you a real sense of peace. And continuing my journey to discover ways I can experience mindfulness, I've ended up here at Float TO for something called sensory deprivation. Let's go inside and check it out. Well, the benefits range from anxiety to stress reduction. One of the other big ones is just, just releasing muscle tension. You'll see when you get out of there, you'll, you'll notice the relaxation right in your face. The way it works is that the water in the tank, because it's got so much salt dissolved in it, is more dense than the water in your body. So you can just lie, lie back and fall asleep and float totally effortlessly. You have no external stimulation coming into your brain, and it's just a really deep, nice relaxation for your nervous system. Oh, wow. Oh my god, you actually do flow. <laughs> Not that I expected any different, but this is amazing. Wow. Well, as I've been floating around here for the last five minutes, all the stress from my mind and body is completely gone. For more health and wellness tips like floating, tune in to One TV. Here in Toronto, Sean Stante for The Zoomer. Thanks, Sean and Diana. Now, from mindful eating to mindful sleep, there are many different types of mindfulness practices that help to manage pain, stress, depression, even negative relationships to food. So let's start there. You know, mindful eating is a fast-growing trend. What is mm -hmm. it, Sue? So I love to start and end my mindfulness groups. We do six-week uh, groups for caregivers and various populations, and we start and end with mindful eating. So it's, I think probably everybody here would agree, because we're familiar with John Kabat-Zinn's Introduction to Meditation, 
coming to our senses, basically putting a raisin in our mouth and focusing on nothing but the experience of eating, right? So we're directing and we're wiring the brain to be in the present moment through food. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful way of showing people mindfulness is not just sitting on the cushion and meditating, although that's incredibly important too, but it's how we live our lives, how we can bring awareness to things we do every day. And we all eat every day. <laughs> but it's not about weight loss. You know, it's almost about rewiring habits. Is that right? Well, the habits of eating. You know, it's the, um, if you slow down and taste your food, you'll enjoy it more and you may eat less of it. Um, and I think the general point with the mindfulness is that if you are paying attention to what you're doing while you do it, it's more beneficial for you. That's true for exercise. There's good evidence for that. And uh, are you uh, living in your life openly or are you just kind of a ghost in your life as it happens? Mm -hmm. So mindfulness helps us tune in and be present. It's one of the, the main benefits of it for ordinary activities. The other thing I'll just flag is what uh, Norm was talking about before, which is can we notice and change habitual patterns, like a pattern to worry, which is a different uh, aspect of training that's also important for mindfulness. Mm -hmm. But uh, for mindful eating, we would certainly start like, um, one example would be if you have peanuts that are just beside you, you're watching television, you might eat the whole bowl. But if the bowl is over here, you're gonna eat a whole lot fewer of them yeah. because you have to notice, oh, they're over there, I'm gonna go get one as opposed to, and then you realize, gee, I guess I did eat the whole bowl. Right, right. right. It sounds um, easier said than done, though. I mean, how have you found applying mindfulness to your life and to your everyday activities? Is it, is it something that you need to constantly think about, or has it now, after five years, really sunk in? I'm, I'm still a beginner. Um, so, yeah, it's a slow process of allowing it to sink into other areas of your life. Um, allowing, for me, the, the struggle to become more conscious of my body and my relationship to my body. And uh, through most of our lives, we're encouraged to you know, live up here. And now I'm trying, tr trying to slowly inhabit my, my, my body mm -hmm. and um, be more aware of the gift of my life and um, uh, that this moment is a gift, whether it's stressful or hard, but it's still a gift and trying to be open to that gift in the moment. Now, there are other types. There's mindful parenting. There's mindful leadership, there's mindful sleep. Uh, you know, when we practice this, again, what's going on in our body and in our minds, Dr. Farb? Yeah, you're right, there's lots of different meditation techniques. There's also lots of different intentions that people bring to any one technique. So one person might be focusing on their breath, trying to get a really nice feeling of relaxation so they can drift off to sleep. Uh, another person might be focusing on their breath so they can notice the types of thoughts that intrude upon that moment and get noticed, oh, here's where my mind goes when I get bored or, or uncomfortable and then learn something about themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the science still hasn't really fully mapped out all the different ways particular practices map onto particular benefits. What we know is you kind of um, have a good chance of getting what you're looking for if you're clear on why you're practicing. So if you're practicing to do something around eating and you're paying more attention to eating, there's a good chance you're gonna have insights around, oh, here's the thing I do that makes me hate myself, <laughs> right? Uh, if you're doing some mindful practice around parenting, you might notice, oh, here's where I go off the rails and I start acting like my parents and I swore I would never do that, you know? Uh, so the attention uh, with some sort of an intention mixed in is where the magic happens. I know I'm up to something and I'm aware of what's going on. And when there's a disconnect, that can be really motivating. Right. Deborah, you have a very public story where you almost changed you changed your life with mindfulness. Yeah. How did that work? I did. Mindful eating, so important. And that was not my goal. I was a size 16, 18, and I didn't really think I had any weight problems, even though my doctor was like, you know, you've got to, you know, be a little bit more careful about what's going on. But I didn't have any awareness of what I was eating, when I was eating, and how much I was eating. So I didn't 
you know, think about mindful eating in and of itself, but when I started my mindfulness practice in 2002 when I was doing yoga and doing it in a mindful way and then carrying that on into other, other meditation, um, it was just something that happened over time. I started to realize like, yeah, I'm not gonna have that second bowl of ice cream. I'm only gonna have one and I'll be fine. I'll just eat it more slowly and really appreciate it. And then it was, maybe I don't need ice cream. Maybe I need yogurt and fruit and a little bit of honey and see how that works out. So slowing things down and, and becoming aware of what my temptations were. I really liked what you had to say about the peanut bowl beside you when you're watching TV or over here. And for me, it's not having it in the house at all. But I have to say, that has not stopped me from eating bad food. Like last night, my husband made home the fries, uh, we had fish and chips. My nephew had a big catch of fish, and so we had a big, a big party and, and we had a, a full meal, but I didn't eat too much. So I knew I was gonna enjoy, and I had a Coke, that's something I don't do very often, but I'm gonna enjoy that. And so it doesn't have to be you know, really strict, and, and it's just being aware without judgment. Being aware that, oh, this is going on, I know where this is gonna go, but because I'm aware of that, I'm just gonna say, okay, that's enough. Well, so it really helped. If a Coke is your worst indulgence, <laughs> then I think you're all right. <laughs> uh, when we come back, simple tips to practice mindfulness every day. Don't go away. If we want things to change in our lives, we have to do things differently than we've just been doing them. And so uh, mindfulness is an access point to that. what it means to be mindful and the benefits of being present. The hard part is making it a regular practice. So Dr. Kelly, what are some practical and simple ways that we can be more mindful in our everyday? You mentioned the peanut example. What other tips do you have for people? Well, if you want to develop a new good habit, start small, right? So to do something for even three minutes, and um, I think we'll have an example of that soon. Even doing that is a, an excellent beginning. Right? And then there are apps that are available. Uh, if you do 10 minutes, uh, that's great. There's some research from England that five minutes a day of a mindfulness practice is enough to start to change how the brain works. So a little bit is good. These things are skills that can be developed. Right? So if you want to learn to play the piano, learn to figure skate, you know that you have to practice. It's good to have a coach to get some feedback. And steady practice or regular practice makes a big difference as opposed to doing, you know, going to a retreat maybe once a year, to do something 20 minutes a day most days of the week would be uh, much better in the long run. And uh, Paul was mentioning too what changes came for him that if we start with something just to have that chance to tune in and be with ourselves and maybe notice where our thoughts are going, bring ourselves back, um, that can be very encouraging. You'll start to see that you can concentrate better, you're less reactive to your kids, to what's going on. So that kind of feedback then helps you think, gee, I should make more time for this in my life. Mm -hmm. So it's good to start small, because if you start too big, you'll probably think, I just really can't take 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have something called a, a three breath meditation. Yes. Walk us through that. Okay, so um, we call it just three breaths because it's just three breaths. So many people, like we've all been saying, find it difficult to come to the practice to do maybe 15, even 30 minutes a day. Some people, especially parents who are looking after a young child, and we work in the autism community where they may have a, an adult child with autism, they also may have a parent um, who's aging with complications at home. They say, I can't even do 15 minutes a day. What do you got? So we talk about just three breaths, but here's the piece to it. We want people to bring all their concentration. So remember the 20 minute workout, you know, like way back in the day, they said, you can't phone it in, gotta do the whole thing. So we ask people to really bring all their concentration with kind of a compassionate discipline, mm -hmm. right? So we'll do this right now, but I ask you to bring all your attention, bring your full game. The mind will wander. I always say, just like a tap drips, the mind just drips thoughts. Just notice them. You don't have to get upset if they're there, but just bring your awareness. So shall we try it? And I would just encourage our audience to also participate if you're willing. Of course. Okay. So 
We always start off with an invitation. I like to make things optional for people because neurodiversity exists. We all have different brains and we'll respond differently. You can do these all the mindfulness techniques with your eyes open or closed. So if you'd like to close them, please do that now. If you'd like to keep them open, I just ask that you have command of your gaze. And what I mean by that is just look down at one object so the mind's not wandering. And we're going to turn our full attention to the breath right now. How do we do that? We want to pay attention to direct physical sensations. So if you'd like to put your hand on your belly, you're welcome to do that because that'll help you feel the belly as it expands out. And when we do breath awareness meditations, you'll get an extra benefit of stimulating your vagus nerve, which is a nerve that goes down from the brain stem all the way down the spine, curves around the belly. So right now, just really expand the breath and let the belly balloon out when you breathe in. So now we're going to do just three breaths with our undivided attention. This time we're going to do just on the belly, moving in and out. So breathing in, feeling the belly expanding. And when you breathe out, just pay attention to that natural letting go, relaxing. Breathing in again, belly expands back out. Now this time, when you breathe out, see if you can relax the whole body. Give yourself permission to just relax when you breathe out. So breathing in again. When you breathe out, relax and befriend gravity. Just let the body get heavier, softer, more relaxed. When you're open, or when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Just relaxing and just returning. See if you can maintain that awareness of the breath, because the art is carrying it with us. Thank you. Thank you for walking us through that. Um, one of the things that I've come to learn about mindfulness, um, and I think the, there is still developing research on it, is you know, for, it really does benefit people with, with depression or anxiety or who suffer from stress. Paul is a perfect example of someone who's benefited from it. And in many ways, it actually eases up capacity in our system, in our healthcare system. And, and to do simple things like what Sue just walked us through, it can help so tremendously. What have you found? Is it equal to you know, psychotherapy? Uh, yeah, so research by uh, colleagues of ours, such as uh, Zindel Siegel at the University of Toronto as well, um, have shown that you can take someone off their antidepressants if they go into a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy program and they will not be at any uh, increased risk of, of relapse. Whereas normally if you take someone off their antidepressants and they're used to using them to stay, stabilize their moods, uh, they'll relapse at a very high rate, like maybe a coin flip, whether they're gonna have a depressive episode in the next year or not. So as a, a sort of exit strategy for a lifetime of antidepressant use, I think there's a, a ton of potential there. Um, for other disciplines beyond pain, anxiety, and depression, I think the research literature is still younger, but there's a lot of potential as well. It's just a matter of having enough independent sites replicate uh, the findings to really um, believe that you can use it um, in any one particular area. So I would have sort of guarded optimism at this point if you're not in one of those sort of major um, areas where the evidence is really strong already. All right, well, when we come back, Deborah Devine joins me with simple mindful yoga poses that you can do from the comfort of your own home. That's next. <laughs> Feeling this wonderful energy rising up the spine. Inhale the arms up. Like a tree. Yes, like a tree. Welcome back. Deborah Devine, host of Healing Yoga on One TV, joins me now to walk through three easy mindful yoga poses that you can practice at home. Deb, thanks for joining Thank me. Thank you very much for inviting me. I just want to say that the first, you know, 
I guess the first quote in this very important yoga document, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, says that yoga is the calming of the thought fluctuations of the mind. And that's sort of the idea where we have this yoga and mindfulness connection. Um, and there's an element of compassion involved. So we were talking earlier about can we do the pose properly? Is it being done right? And, you know, even if we don't do the yoga poses exactly how it looks on a yoga magazine cover, we can still be really um, kind to ourselves and appreciate what we're doing while we're doing it. Oh, perfect. Well, why don't we get started? So let's take the left foot forward, Mirsa, and the right foot back. All the toes are facing forward, and we're just gonna think about where our balance is, where our connection to the ground is, and moving all of our energy of our mind down into that place, not thinking about anything else, and just being fine with where our stance is. You can change it up if you're stiff, bring your feet closer together. If you feel more limber, take your back leg back, and then find out if your hips are square to your shoulders. Take the right hip forward and the left hip back and then press down into the ground. Press down into your ball of the uh, big toe on the front foot, ball of the baby toe on the front foot and the heel of the front foot. And your knee is right on top of the ankle and then you're pressing back with the back heel and energizing the back leg. So what should we be feeling for then? We're going to be feeling engagement of the muscles, hugging muscle to bone. All of this power is going to be, you know, sensed, you're going to be sensing rising power out of the ground here. Now we're going to be engaging the pelvis, all the glutes energized, and then we're going to lift the front of the spine. We're gonna lift the front of the heart, broaden the collarbones, lengthen the back of the neck so the head can rise up, and then we're gonna straighten and bend the front knee. Just do that a couple of times. Bending and straightening with the breath or keeping your awareness where, keeping your breath into the awareness of where something else might be happening. Right now, I've been doing a lot of sitting this morning, so I'm feeling it on that right front hip, and I'm just mm. breathing and being aware that every time I go through a cycle, I'm feeling a little bit more loosening up going on. Are you feeling that? Yes, but it's also um, becoming a little more laborious. Yes, it is. We're getting a bit of a workout here, aren't we? <laughs> okay, let's take the back foot forward. Ah, notice what's happening. We're just resting here. We're finding out what just happened, integrating that into our consciousness, into our body. Now we've got a new situation happening with our body so we can use that information to tell us where we need to be on the other side. Left foot back, right foot forward, pressing down into the heel of the front foot, and then going up and down, just noticing this side is a little bit different. Maybe it's a little bit more challenging. Well, that's just my question is, you know, what happens if this side does feel different? Good question. So we have natural imbalances in our body and all we wanna do is be aware of them. And then maybe, you know, in my personal practice, I had an injury on one side, so I'm gonna take it easier on that one side. And maybe I've got a weak other side that, you know, I need to kind of juice up a bit because it's my non-dominant side. I'm gonna do an extra round of whatever on that side. Okay. Let's bring the back foot forward. We're gonna do warrior pose. <sighs> How does that feel right now? Great. Yeah, I, I love great. this for the front of the hips, especially when we're sitting. Maybe everybody could do that when they come home tonight. Let's take the right foot back, left foot forward. Front leg is straight, and we're gonna look at her stance. Pressing into the baby toe side of the back foot, taking the knee of the front leg over toward the baby toe side of the front foot. Knee is right on top of the ankle, press down. Feel that wonderful energy of energizing, the muscles of the leg pressing down and then this energy bouncing back up. Baby toe side of the back foot is the anchor. So we're getting all of this energy rising up the back leg, energize the glutes, feel this lifting on the front of the spine, reach out with your sword in the front hand, your shield in the back hand, breathing. Long, slow, smooth in breaths. Where is the breath going in your body? How important is breathing in these poses, in these exercises? Breathing is really important. And the more that we can maintain an awareness of whether we're breathing in or breathing out, the easier some of these poses become. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna do this, this pose in a static kind of way, but then we're gonna come out of it when we fatigue. But the breath can help you kind of keep going a little bit longer. So maybe it would be three breaths if you weren't really paying attention, but you can spend five breaths if you're really aware of everything that's going on in your body. And every time you take a breath cycle, you're finding out something different about yourself. Do you wanna do tree pose now? Sure. All right. We're gonna do um, tree with the left foot, pressing down, spread the toes nice and wide, and then visualize the ball of the big toe, the ball of the baby toe, and the heel with roots coming down. 
Think about secondary roots, tertiary roots. Now you've got this really great foundation and then the right foot can come to the ankle. You can bring it up a little bit higher to the calf. Of course, you know, if you've got your full yoga gear on, you can bring your foot all the way up wherever it feels comfortable. But pressing down with the foot and engaging this awareness of where your roots are at will help you keep balance. So as you build that strength of your balance here in the lower part of the body, you're pressing the foot into the leg, the leg into the foot, engaging the glutes, and you can sense that you're really solid here. If you take your gaze, that soft gaze, to a spot in front of you, then you're really locked on in the bottom part of the body. Mm -hmm. Now, lifting the ribs, engaging the glutes, feeling this wonderful energy rising up the spine. Inhale, the arms up. Like a tree. Yes, like a tree. And you're going to be, you know, feeling your way around what is happening here. The body's doing something different. So you're just so preoccupied that you can't be thinking about what the kids did. You can't be thinking about what your husband's up to. You can't be thinking about that report that you're late with. You know, you're just here trying to maintain your balance. And there's something so fantastic about this kind of mind-body workout that really helps you when you're done your practice. You just go back into the world with a clear mind and an open heart. You're kind to yourself that you didn't nail the pose and you know, it's all right, right? So let's come down. <sighs> Deb, thank you <laughs> so much. When we come back, we'll take questions from the audience. That's next. Nice. Does focus fall off with aging during the meditation practice? We'll take questions from our audience now. Judy, thank you for being here. What's your question? It becomes a challenge, the practice of meditation, the daily practice. I've been told that it's more difficult as you age to keep focus. And I wonder whether that's true because we shouldn't be punishing ourselves if we don't do as well as we thought we could. Does focus fall off with aging during the meditation practice? Great question. What an amazing question. One of the original people who brought mindfulness to the West was a behaviorist, a psychologist at Harvard University by the name of Richard Alpert, eventually became Ram Dass. Um, he wrote a book, he's recently died, but he meditated and was one of the first pioneers bringing mindfulness over to the West. Um, he wrote a book called Be Here Now in the 60s, and then he wrote a book called Still Here about aging and conscious meditation in the aging experience. That was a huge part of his work. And I meditated with Ram Dass when I was younger and then also after he had a stroke. And I'll tell you, he was more spot on and um, greater concentration and skill as a man in his later years post-stroke. Um, I really believe, and all the meditators that we have also at Wellspring in the cancer community, I see people still concentrating beautifully and accepting, right? It's that space of accepting where we're at because wherever we're at, that's what the curriculum is, that's the experience, and I really think people continue even with brain fog and cancer. I think some things obviously are going to decline as, as you get older. The only thing that doesn't decline really is, is verbal like language ability. Um, but it's a, I think a good question to ask is what would make like a perfect meditation, right? So perfect meditation is not a meditation where your mind never wanders and you have perfect focus. There's no challenge there. So I think what might be um, an empowering way to look at it is if you're touching in on focus and losing focus and then realizing that, oh, I've been gone for a while, maybe it was 30 seconds, maybe it was 20 minutes, and then you can come back. Each of those moments is still the, the heart of the practice, is of sort of noticing what's going on, bringing yourself back in line with your intentions. And um, you wouldn't uh, want to have a meditation where you had absolutely no focus. So if you're getting no traction at all, maybe that, that's a problem. But the fact that the mind is wandering is, is part of the practice, right? And, and where it wanders to is going to provide you with some sort of information no matter what age, what age you are. So as long as there's an ability to sort of 
sit without too much discomfort and, and engage in a sort of cycle of focus, lose focus, notice, come back, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about whether age is going to deprive you of the ability to, to do it right. I guess you're right because you don't really get a mark for a good meditation <laughs> or, or a bad one. So we just have to be kind to ourselves and accept what it is. I think so, as long as you're, there's something there that you can sense, right? I think if, you, if you're getting nothing and you just wake up an hour later and you fell asleep every time, maybe it's time to try a different meditation. But if you're there a little bit, then it, I would say it's, it's working. All right, okay. thank you, Judy. Thank you. Yeah, my question is, um, um, I've uh, had uh, numerous friends, my mother, uh, all with uh, uh, dementia. And um, I, uh, my question was, uh, how does um, mindfulness um, apply in regards to dementia? Dr. Farb. So I moonlit a bit as a postdoc uh, running mindfulness groups with older adults when I worked at uh, Baycrest. And uh, we ran a small group for caregivers and spouses with dementia. Um, and so I'll give you the, the bad news first is, I, there's no evidence mindfulness is going to reverse or cure dementia. But as providing a space where a, a caregiver and someone who is afflicted with dementia can practice together on, and be on equal grounds, no longer have to come up with the right word or the right memory, no longer have this sort of parent-child relationship that sort of equalize people in the moment because they're just human beings trying to contact with what's happening right now, it was beautiful. So in terms of um, being able to make common time where uh, there's no asymmetry in, in roles and feeling like you can actually share space together, it was hugely effective. Did it bring people's memory back or restore parts of the brain that had physically deteriorated? No, but the quality of life improved. So I'd say there's a, there's a lot of potential there as long as we don't sell it as um, a way of reversing brain changes or something like that. Sue, did you and, want? Yeah, so what we're uh, exploring at CAMH at um, the Neurodevelopmental Disorders Clinic is the same experience, so cognitive disorders, de neurodevelopmental disorders, but what we're looking at is uh, not whether or not it can reverse dementia, like you're saying, unfortunately, we can't really do that, um, that we know of yet, but we're looking at the relationship. So the caregiving relationship. And we're um, providing tools uh, for the caregiver to be present, to use all these mindfulness practices that we've talked about, to be in the present moment. So with the person who's going through whatever kind of challenges, and we're finding uh, depression's going down, anxiety's going down, um, and the well-being and the satisfaction in that relationship is improving, right? So it's around being present. Um, and we do these groups online. Sometimes caregivers aren't able to leave their homes, right? Because they're stuck at home. So in the last couple of years, we've been researching how care caregivers can benefit when they're stuck at home doing all these practices. And, and it helps. We're seeing a real real decrease in depression. And, yeah. Now, I don't have any uh, yeah. research. I can only give you anecdotal, but my passion is teaching yoga to people who need help. And our healthcare system is not really working well right now. And dealing with people that are going through dementia, going through Alzheimer's, not just the people that are dealing with it, but the folks who are caring for them. Mindful movement, so helpful. Mindful movement, laughter yoga, that's not really official mindful practice per se, but there is a lot of benefit that can be seen from their behavior because their emotional regulation is happening, their cortisol levels, their stress levels are going down, so they're a little bit more manageable, if you will. You know, if they were having violent episodes, maybe they're not quite so active. You know, they're a little bit more gentle. Um, so th through the different you know places that I teach over the years, it's incredible to me how something so simple as quieting the mind can really be effective, not necessarily for reversing all these problems, but managing the symptoms and mitigating some of the more challenging ones. So, all right. Well, thank you for your for your question. When we come back, final thoughts from our panelists. That's nice. Don't forget, for free tickets to the show, go to www.universe.com and search Zoomer Media and log on to www.thezoomertv.com for full episodes and more. Welcome back to the Zoomer. It's that time in the show when our panelists leave you with their final thoughts. So we'll start to my left. 
Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Farb was talking earlier about the research that mindfulness can help people that have severe anxiety, we might say mild to moderate depression, stress problems. For these kinds of things, it's important to work with a facilitator that has had proper training. If you have a coach that uh, has only had light exposure themselves, how can they guide you skillfully? So if you're interested in this kind of help, find out what kind of training or background someone's had and, that, and uh, really trust your own instinct about that. It's a practice, mindfulness, uh, and for me, uh, the meditation is the main practice. And it's slowly opened me up to the gift of my life. And uh, that's our life happens right now in the present moment. And uh, that's a great gift to be aware of. Thank you. Linda? I would just like to leave the folks with the idea that it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to just roll out your yoga mat and then you do your mindfulness or you sit on the cushion and then you do your mind. You do your mindfulness all day long. When Last night, the washing machine and the dryer both broke at the same time, and where I might have not had a very relaxed response to that, now with this kind of emotional regulation, I feel a lot more able to deal with all of the things that life throws at us, so. Yeah, I would say that uh, if we want things to change in our lives, we have to do things differently than we've just been doing them. <laughs> and so uh, mindfulness is an access point to that. It's an access point to getting clear on what are your habits? And then you have the power to make a decision. Are these habits working for me or not? And so with just spending a couple minutes a day checking in with like, what am I really doing? <laughs> what's really happening for me now? Um, I can't say exactly what's going to happen and neither can you. And that's the magic of it. Right? So if you want something to change, paying attention to what's happening right now can be an access point to that change. And it doesn't take, uh, as the other panelists have been saying, a huge time commitment. It takes just tuning in for a couple of minutes a day to begin with and seeing whether there's some traction there. For me, one of the most important things is making mindfulness accessible for you. So no matter what's going on in your life, you can find a way of bringing the techniques in a way that will help you be mindful and get all the wonderful benefits that we know from the research. So finding that way that clicks for you and don't worry and beat yourself up thinking you're doing it wrong if the mind is wandering start again, and any stage of life is an amazing time to start it. All right, well, a big thank you to my panelists for being here, to the audience in studio and at home. That's all the time we have. We'll see you soon. For now, it's time to zoom out.